Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our weekly Penguins chat. Andrew Destin with Matt Venzel. He's coming to you guys from New York. We're recording this on Sunday night ahead of Monday's game with the Penguins squaring off against the New York Rangers, the first of three games in four nights. Um, a lot to get into in this one. We're going to be looking ahead to the future, looking ahead to the rest of the season. Um, but first thing I want to get into is starting this week off at the beginning of last week, uh, which was on Tuesday when the Penguins squared off against the Carolina Hurricanes. And with that came the return of Jake Gensel to Pittsburgh for the first time. Um, Matt, you were on the scene for that. I was still coming back from uh, Colorado. Just you were to- skiing. <laughs> Don't say you were coming back from Colorado. You were skiing. Anyways, continue. On that note, I was enjoying myself doing anything but watching Penguins hockey. Apologies, everybody. Uh, but what were your takeaways from Jake's comments? Because I know he had a few after the game. Um, and Jake is not somebody who usually... Um, you know, we'll make anything inflammatory comment wise. I don't think that there was anything in that regard, but still some telling comments from him. What do you make of what Jake said post game? Yeah. I, I mean, some fans were upset. I mean, everybody was all worked up all over the fan base for different reasons. Cause it rehashed the whole Jake cancel trade in the first place, but you know, some people in my mentions, and I know that's just a small sliver of the fan base, but some people thought that something that Jake said was outrageous or was disrespectful to, to the penguins I didn't see that at all. He was asked probably a dozen questions, many of them centered on him leaving the Penguins. And, you know, at one point, yeah, he admitted, yeah, I wanted to stick around. It was my preference to stay. Um, You know, and and some people put in the subtext that, well, why didn't you stay? Why didn't you accept a team-friendly deal? But, um, you know, we don't entirely know where the truth lies there. But Jake did want to stay. He wanted to stick around. And then the other thing he said was, you know, a lot of fans want to know, is he going to come back? So he was asked, you know, is the door closed on that? And he kind of laughed it off and then thought for a second and just said, you know, I'm not worried about that right now. And I'm happy in Carolina. So I didn't see those as inflammatory comments. I I did think they were noteworthy though. And it was just kind of an honest assessment from Jake and it aligns with everything that I've heard about, you know, his feelings about sticking around, Um, you know, and, of course it brought everything back about whether they should have traded him in the first place and whether they got enough for him and um, all that. So I don't know if you want to rehash all that, but in terms of his comments, yeah, I I thought it was a, you know, a rare moment where a hockey player was candid, but you know, I don't think anything he said was, you know, inflammatory or disrespect for the Penguins. It's just being honest. Yeah. Which, I mean, you kind of expect as much in that situation. And I thought the one answer in particular to the idea of coming back, it's like, you know, it's not that it's an inappropriate question and one that needs to be asked in that setting, but it's also like, okay, well, this guy has a very good shot at coming back and winning the Stanley Cup with the Hurricanes team that looks really good right now. But from a Penguins perspective, I mean, you know, it, it's too much to look ahead to next offseason, but just based on that relationship um, with the Penguins, how things went in contract talks and where we stand, um, you know, as we turn the calendar over to April, um, you have to think that that has to have impacted things in some regard to – The idea of Jake coming back is just whatever did or didn't go down with contract talks. Um, I'm not in the business of speculating about whether or not he'll come back to the Penguins, but you have to believe that the way things are handled, um, that has an impact on his perception of the franchise, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That context matters. And I do think it was a fair question. And, you know, you can ask this question knowing a guy probably isn't going to answer it. But it was worth asking because people, you know, think, okay, well, he loves Pittsburgh. He's going to come back. But you know, it's clear Jake was disappointed by what happened. Um, you know, the reporting around this has is really there hasn't been a ton of reporting about what exactly happened between Jake and Kyle. Um, both sides have kind of hinted that there were never serious contract talks, at least during the season. You know, Cal Dubas has said that they kind of talked um, last off season. That might have just been sort of fact finding, but you know, both sides kind of hinted that you know there were never serious talks, and you know that could be perceived as disappointed, disappointing by Jake Cancel. It certainly felt that way in his tone. So, you know, I think people just say, okay, like he's going to come right back. He loved it here. But, you know, I think, you know, one, are there hurt feelings? Like, does he kind of feel like, okay, like you guys didn't want me? Um, You know, that changes a player's perspective. Two, you mentioned him going to a cup contender. Uh, Not even necessarily him re-signing in Carolina, but just him getting out of Pittsburgh, out of his comfort zone, And, you know, kind of ripping that Band-Aid off where he's exposed to the idea of going somewhere else, whether it's Carolina or, you know, a third team here. You know, I think it could be eye-opening for the player. He says, okay, like, I loved it in Pittsburgh there. I spent a decade there. 
But now that I've kind of experienced something new and I got a taste of uh, a true cup pursuit again, something I haven't experienced for a couple of years, like, you know, maybe I, maybe I want to kind of expand my horizons of what I want to do. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be seen here. I think what plays out on the ice with Gensel this year is obviously going to factor into his thinking. Um, so what I would say is I don't think the door is closed by any means. Um, you know, it doesn't feel at least from, from Gensel's side. Um, but, you know, if I had to, if I had to bet on it now, I, I would bet more likely than not that this reunion doesn't happen, but we'll see. Yeah. It's the swan song that I know that Penguins fans would want, but it's, you look at the history of pro sports. I mean, it's something that doesn't happen very frequent. It's more an anomaly when it does. And especially when you have that kind of context, like we've got here in the Jake Kensel situation. So well, one, one thing two people point out and, and, you know, kind of advocating for the fact that he come back is, is Kyle Dubas said that before they traded Jake, like he went to Jake's house. Um, I believe that's right. Or I don't think Jake went to him. Yeah. He went to Jake's house just to basically meet with them. Um, you know, some people have kind of said, okay, like, would he do that? Um, you know, does that mean that maybe he's more open-minded to him coming back, um, from the Penguins perspective and he's trying to, you know, maintain that relationship. I, I don't know if there's anything to that or not, but that's just another data point here. Yeah. Another thing to bring up, certainly, and, uh, worthwhile for the conversation. Certainly it's looking forward to the 24, 25 season, but, um, we still got a lot to talk about with this team that, um, for whatever reason, still a mathematical chance of making the playoffs. That's not a conversation that I'd like to rehash for this podcast because I don't think it's remotely realistic. Um, but w- there are some points to be made, though, um, about the way that the Penguins are approaching these final you know, handful of games. And one point that I want to get into immediately is the goaltending. Um, we've seen Alex Nedeljkovic start a season high four straight games. Um you know, we haven't seen Tristan Jari since he was pulled early in Dallas, which feels like forever ago. Um, I just want to ask you, Matt, point blank. Uh, what do you make of that development? It's weird. It definitely is weird. Um, you know, Jari has been up and down all year. Um, I know when you kind of put all the numbers together, you know, it spits out a league average goalie. But, you know, this is a guy who still leads the league in shutouts. He's also been pulled in, what, four or five games. Um, not the most reliable guy late in games. So kind of, you know, another up and down season for him. And so it's not like he's earned the right to be in the net, but, you know, it's not like Nadelkovic has been lights out either, which makes it extra, extra strange. I mean, Ned started strong. He had a a law there in the middle of the season, which he would, you know, I talked to him recently and he talked about the inconsistencies there and he has played pretty well in these starts over the last week, but, you know, he's still talking about games where he's allowing three plus goals. Now, some of the fact is there's so many odd man rushes. So I think it's relevant just because, Mike Sullivan's still trying to win games. He's still trying to get to the Penguins in the playoffs. So if he is operating, um, you know, with that in mind and the fact that he thinks Nadalkovich is a better option right now, that's, that's certainly noteworthy. I don't know if that means, um, you know, it's strictly because Ned's playing better or if there's something we don't know with Tristan Jari. But, um, you know, it, it's certainly interesting. You do wonder, like, the team has allowed so many odd man rushes and Nadalkovich is – um, been one of the league's better goalies against the rush. Maybe, maybe that plays into it as well. But um, I don't know. What do you think? What's your read on this situation? Yeah, for me, it's an interesting one because my mind goes to perhaps too speculative of a world on this one. Um, so please pump the brakes and call me out on it. But um, my mind goes to a place of what does this mean more so for Tristan Jari's future as a penguin? Um, and again, I know I'm leading with prefacing saying wow. that I'm, yeah. jumping, I'm <laughs> jumping to a lot of conclusions here. But I bring all this up because – I think this is a trial run to an extent to see with Alex Nedeljkovic. He's proven himself in a backup role. It seems like there's mutual interest from both sides, at least, you know, in him speaking to you, saying that he would like to come back to Pittsburgh. Remains to be seen whether he comes back after signing the one-year deal. But let's say for sake of argument that Nedeljkovic does come back. Is that in a role where it's, hey, can we pair this guy with a Joel Blomquist and call him up from the AHL for next season after he's proven himself to have a really good first year in North America and you shop Tristan Jari this summer on a reasonable contract for a goalie. Now, again, I'm jumping through a lot of hoops, but that's just me coming to that conclusion of Womquist has looked really good. Nadalkovic has been very solid to above average in a backup role. Perhaps you're seeing what you have in Nadalkovic if you continue to increase that sample size rather than just as a backup goalie. Proceed to call me out. When did you become a tinfoil hat guy? Look at this conspiracy theory. Um, 
I don't know. I, I mean, I think with Blomquist, it's just it. Even though he's been great um, in his first year in North America, he was Wilkes All Star, Lone All Star. Um, young goalies, um, their development is is so weird, um, and it can be stop and start, and you don't want to overload a guy. And I just don't think the Penguins are at a point where they can go into next year, like banking on him being their starter, let alone even banking on him being their number two. I mean, I think the way the Penguins should operate is going to the year. I would bring Nadalkovich back if the money's all right and, and basically say, OK, like Blomquist, go out and beat this guy out. And if you're clearly the better goalie, you'll be here. Um, but I don't think you can count on him being an NHL goalie next year. I mean, I think if that happens, it's a bonus. So I don't know if the Penguins are there quite yet. Um, I also think like if you're trying to shop Tristan Jari, you probably want him playing well and playing a lot and showing other teams that he's someone you want to trade for um, instead of putting him on the shelf when you're still trying to win the playoff game. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying there isn't a chance that the Penguins could turn around and trade Tristan Jari. Um, You know, I think absolutely everything should be on the table if you're operating under the, the framework of the, core four coming back and Sullivan, like something's got to change. Um, so maybe they do get there, but I don't know if uh, that is much of a factor in what's going on here right now with Nadalkovich playing all these games. Yeah, it was a wild leap and it was one that my mind went to, but I had a hunch that- Did you was- hit your head while you were skiing? This is like a whole new guy. You're like hot <laughs> well, takes, conspiracy theories. Look at well, you. Well, I will say, okay, this is wildly embarrassing. I haven't told you this. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, so I don't know if all you right. can- I don't know if you can see on camera, but I've got like a gash right here. Mm-hmm. Um, that's sure. from going on a run in Lawrenceville and hitting a street sign. Yeah. Wow. Do you know other people? It's probably not a lot of people, but still a number of people are watching this and listening to this and you just admitted this. That's great. Yep. How do you run into a street sign? I know you're tall, but geez. All right. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, it happens when you look at your phone because you're a millennial or whatever the hell generation I'm from and you don't pay attention to the road. Yeah, I'll, I'll own this one. All right. Not a good look. Um, on that note, though, about the goaltending, my last point there would just be that um, if it, indeed Sullivan's words ring true where he's saying we're trying to give ourselves the best chance to win whatever coach jargon um, with putting Nidalkovich in net, if the Penguins do get eliminated uh, officially here pretty darn soon, do you imagine that's what it would take to put Tristan Jari back in? Or do we see him as soon as, okay, it's a back-to-back, he's going to start one of these games, and then he gets the fourth or the third game in four nights against Washington? What do you expect here this week? Yeah, I mean, I you know, based on what we know about how Sullivan handles the goalies, it, I think it's very much into whoever's playing the best is going to play. So, yeah, Jari will play one of these games in the back-to-back, and if he plays well and Ned – doesn't then you know we'll see Jari in Washington um if it's the inverse of that then we'll probably see Ned play two of the next three so um you know I think that's kind of the thinking right now um you do worry just the other thing I mean if we're putting tinfoil hats on you you wonder about an injury with with Tristan given his injury history and um you know everything we know about that's gone on the last couple of years um but as far as we've been told it's performance based so yeah uh, before we get into any more topics here, we got a couple of more segments to get into. I want to remind everybody that this podcast is brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. Again, that's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. All right, the next point I want to get into is that to some degree, fans finally get their wish, uh, and that's in getting a few young guys into the lineup. Um, Obviously, we've already seen Jonathan Gruden this year get a number of games, you know, a little bit more than a baker's dozen, but we also more significantly saw Sam Poulin get called up. He's gotten a few games in under his belt. What's been your impression of seeing Sam get into the lineup for a handful of games uh, and work on that fourth line? Yeah, I mean, I think he's been all right, and that's okay because you're giving him an opportunity to get his feet wet, get comfortable, and and hopefully you want to see progress 
um, as the rest of the season goes on here. Um, your boy, Jack St. Ivany, is, is earning praise as well. So, yeah, it's just the fact that the Penguins have, have given finally given opportunities and runway to some young players, and we expect these guys to get sent back down the Wilkes or some of them for their playoff run. But just the fact that they're in the lineup and getting experience and the front office is getting a chance to, you know, evaluate them at an NHL level, I, I think is significant. Um, yeah, I don't know what you've seen from Poulin. Um, you know, we talked last week about his, what his role might be. I was wrong about that. I, I thought they wouldn't slot him into a fourth line role, but that's what they haven't been right now. But, um, you know, what have your, been your impressions of that trio in particular? Yeah, that trio in particular, it's, you know, a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to really gauge too much, especially on Saturday where they're getting such limited ice time. You know, the game against the Blue Jackets where they lose in the shootout, it's so much special teams that that line never really got deployed all that much. But in these few games, um, my biggest takeaway from Poulin is, you know, I like the hockey sense. I think he's got solid vision and a decent shot, but I do have questions a little bit about the skating. Um, that The speed certainly hasn't looked like it's there. I don't know uh, if that's something that's gonna should be expected to continue to develop. Um, I know that's always been a little bit of a question with him as a prospect is just does he have NHL level skating speed. Um, to me, that's probably the biggest question mark that I have. And unfortunately for Sam, uh, you know, a guy who, uh, you know, candidly, I'll say you root for somebody like that who's gone through the adversity that he has. It's not coming from a fan standpoint, more so just as a human. Um, you know, the skating is certainly something that stands out to me is maybe something that's been uh, holding him back, if that's the right way to put it. What's been No, doing? I mean, that's been a knock on him since his draft year. Um, you know, it's an area where he's made strides, no pun intended. Um, I didn't want to say it, but I was like, I'm going to sit here thinking on another way to phrase it. So I'm just going to say it. Yeah. No, literally no pun intended, but yeah, I mean, he, he's made a little bit of progress, but yeah, you're right. It's not a strength of his, um, you know, maybe it's not to the point where it's something that would prevent him from playing in the league. But, you know, I think with Sam, yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, character, intelligence, um, effort, I mean, all that stuff is there with them. You know, I, I just don't know that he's a player that has like one standout trait, you know, a shot, obviously not a skating. Um, you know, he's gotten better defensively, but I don't think he's, you know, going to become the next Patrice Bergeron or something like that. So, you know, I still think that, you know, in the right situation, he can become a, you know, a third line type player in the NHL. Um, but I don't think his ceiling goes beyond that. But for the Penguins, it's fine. And, you know, you talk about this team, they're trying to get in. I think a lot of fans want them to lose so they can get a better draft pick or keep that draft pick. I mean, you know, it's, I, I think that's not an unreasonable way of looking at it. But you would think putting in a bunch of young and inexperienced guys would kind of aid in the losing. But those guys actually have given them a boost, maybe not every single night. But, um, you know, you talk about that Carolina game. Um, the young players came in and gave the team a boost. So um, funny thing what happens when you do get some young, hungry players in the lineup instead of, you know, a bunch of guys who are um, maybe not a bunch, but a, a team that might have a few guys who are looking forward to working on their tans. I don't know. At least that's how they played after the trade deadline. Yeah, tans and golf. I mean, that's that's what I'm looking forward to this summer, that and Pirates baseball. But um, I, you bring up the guys who have, you know, kind of brought a boost to the lineup, though, and you mentioned – my boy, Jack St. Ivany, of course, really appreciate that uh, designation. But what's been Do you think he's ever walked into a street sign? He's uh, no. not as tall as you. Maybe that's something you two can talk about. We are both 6'3". Um, yeah, that's probably the only thing we haven't talked a story idea. Yeah, that's that's the piece. Stay tuned. PostHavenGazette.com coming out tomorrow morning. Um, what's been your takeaway of St. Ivany on the blue line, though? I know Sullivan's raved about him. What's been your takeaway from his game? Yeah, I just think he's steady, doesn't try to do too much. Um, obviously, his size is an asset. Um, I think he skates all right. You know, I don't know a ton about him, um, to be honest. Like, he's one of those players that have just sort of been in Wilkes for a little while and, you know, wasn't obviously a, considered a top prospect or anything like that. But, um, you know, he's just kind of steadily endeared himself to the organization. So, um, you can't help but think about the player that he replaced. I mean, maybe that's ultimately the role that he ends up playing in the NHL. And I'm talking about Chad Ruedel. Obviously, he's about 28 inches taller than Chad. But, um, you know, just a guy who is going to play in your third pair. Um, you know, he's a righty, so you're not going to play a ton behind Carlson and, and Latang. But, you know, when you're in there, you're steady. You're going to kill some penalties. You're not going to make egregious turnovers. Um, you know, I think that's – 
kind of his path it appears to, to becoming a regular NHL player and sticking in, in Pittsburgh. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you've seen something or you probably won't admit it because you guys are best friends now, but like, I, I haven't noticed any like glaring mistakes where I'm like, Oh my God, what was that? Um, you know, that's come from 58, not from, from St. Ivany. Yeah. 58. We're getting into in a second. That'll be the last piece. Good, good way of tipping the hand there. Um, but with St. Ivany, yeah. I mean, the only mistake you could theoretically say was just that he got deked out of his skates on one goal again on Saturday, but it's like, that's not a mental error. That's just, you know, a mistake in terms of a guy beat you, but, um, yeah, I mean, the comparisons to Ruedel, I think, are very valid, and I think that's exactly the role that he's trying to play. That's I'm not breaking any news that's obvious, but, like, he's done a decent job of trying to replicate that, I think, so far. And overall, I look at the way that St. Ivany plays, and, yeah, that can be helpful to the Penguins. Um, and I think that this, you know, remaining stretch of games is pretty darn important to see, is this a guy who factors into next season? My initial impressions, just in five games, is – uh, why not? I mean, you can do worse than having a guy on a minimum contract like that uh, as your third pair right shot defenseman. I think St. Ivany certainly has impressed me more than, say, John Ludwig or Ryan Shea has. There's no question about that. Is that him texting you right now? <laughs> I wish. Why, don't, why don't you put your phone on mute and tell Jack that you'll, you'll give him a call back in a few minutes? Man, I'm really struggling over here. Uh, again, viewers, thank you, listeners. Um, I'm using a new laptop because I cracked the screen oh, I, boy. Uh, on my last one. So I have no idea. And I'm horrible with technology. I don't know how to mute like the messages on your laptop. So I'm, yeah, I'm really struggling here. I'm sorry, guys. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's been, You've a been sitting in this posh, what is this, a hotel all day? I, I've been driving. <laughs> I woke up, did the Easter Bunny thing, um, had breakfast with the family and hit the road and I get here and I show up and I'm ready to rock and you've been just waiting and you couldn't even get the audio squared away. All right. What do we got next? Uh, Crystal Tang, you ready to bash? No. Um, Mike Sullivan admitted that he didn't think Latang's been in his best recently. I know last week on the podcast uh, you discussed as much we did about how things have kind of trended in the wrong direction for him. Hasn't been really a good month for Latang in general. Um, what do you make of that comment from Sullivan? And how much of a concern is this for the Penguins moving forward, given the term remaining on Latang's deal and just the nature of that you know, core four, like you brought up earlier? Yeah, Sullivan doesn't really criticize players, but if the player is just saying playing like so obviously bad, he will be like, "All right, yeah, fine." <laughs> he hasn't been playing great, so that's what we've had with Chris. And um, you know, as we've seen with Chris Rauder's career, like when he screws up, he really makes it count. Um, and he's done that recently with some of his passes, with some of his, um, you know, you think of the the OT goal in Colorado where, um, you know, he kind of thought, okay, I got this, I can skate with Drew in, and then um, he lost that race. And, and then obviously his defending issues, I mean, um, yeah, so you do wonder with him. I mean, he is an older player as well. Um, and we all know about his his um, work ethic and the shape he keeps himself in. And he played so well for, for most of the year. Um, so trying to think about whether this is going to be a concern going forward. I mean, I do think the mistakes that you're seeing are tied to, like, it's not all metal. It's it's physical. It's like him not having that skating stride to, to win a race with Drew Ann in overtime. It's him, you know, the the – really where he got twisted around there in Columbus the other night. Um, you know, that looked like kind of a, a mental or a, a physical error, a skating error, and kind of got himself in a position. So it's not all these mental miscues. And I do think you worry about that a little bit. Like, okay, like, is this just a guy who it's been a long season and there's not a ton to play for and he's kind of just run out of gas mentally and emotionally and physically? Or is this a sign that, you know, suddenly he's, taking a steep decline. I, I'm more of the belief that it's the former. Um, you know, I, I think coming back next year, um, we'll probably see a similar Latang to what we saw for much of the season, but I don't know for a fact. He doesn't know for a fact um, with players who get into their late thirties. Um, sometimes you just see a guy go right off a cliff. So I don't think we're there, but I guess you can't rule out the possibility. Yeah, I don't think you can rule out anything here. The only comment that I think, you know, I can make with confidence is just that the decline is not nearly as sharp as what we've seen from Evgeny Malkin this year, right? Is that I don't think you can group this or categorize this in the same ballpark as what we've seen from Malkin. 
but it's still to me a little bit concerning if you're a Penguins fan just because the minutes that he carries, um, you know, it leads me to wonder to some degree of, hey, next year, does that mean that you have to reduce the minutes a little bit? Um, if this is, you know, the byproduct of a guy who um, I think it was the Thursday game when Ryan Graves got hurt, had the concussion, um, Latang had 30 minutes of ice time. You know, is that something that you can, you know, obviously that's a particular circumstance, but moving forward, is this a guy that you could reliably count on to skate 24 or 25 minutes a night? Um, you know, that's where my, my mind goes as a guy turns 37 years old, um, for next season. So not yeah, much I mean, of- I think he, I think he still ranks, I, I might be wrong. I, I think he's still top 10 in minutes. Maybe it's top 15. Um, you know, he's a guy who's still playing a lot and, um, plays harder minutes than Carlson, mm-hmm. um, you know, with the PK work and just his style of play. I mean, I know he's not like an enforcer in front of the net, but, um, you know, he's willing to mix it up and, and battle along the boards and in front of the net where, you know, we don't really see that from Eric Carlson. So even if their their minutes totals are pretty close, it's um, his minutes are, are not the same as Eric Carlson's minutes. Um, we'll put it that way. Yeah, touche. Very good point there. So I mean, I'm I'm not meant to. Yeah. Not Carlson. I mean, Carlson's like an offensive um, finesse creator, and that's not quite what Latang is. I mean, they have some overlap in their skill sets and the way they play, but. Um, they're different players. Yeah, different players for sure. Yeah, it's by no means a knock. It's just the reality of it. And in part, probably why it might mean that any decline between either player, it'll probably be a little bit more um, noticeable, I guess, would be the way of phrasing it with Latang, just given you know that it's a little bit more defensive-minded. But um, that's pretty much my last point there was just going to bring up uh, with Latang talking about him and what we've seen from him this last week and really this last month. Um, before we wrap it up, stick taps. Uh you got anything? Am I leading this one off? What do you got? You can go first. Do you want to say who I'm doing? Uh, uh, is it Jackson Ivan? Congrats. You did it. Uh, like, you got to pick somebody else. Okay. This is just getting uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my real one would be Alex Ndelkovic. Um, I do think that um, this is all told, been a good season for him. Um, I'm not just talking about the fact that he's gotten four straight starts the fact that he's kind of taken over the goal for jari recently it's that um i would say you know we've brought up this point multiple times this year of who has truly exceeded expectations i would say that he'd be one of the few guys who has it's been a bounce back season for him after a couple of rotten ones in detroit so uh kudos to him for getting as much time in net as he has and kudos to him on the heck of a season really um what about you uh i will give mine to Sidney crosby Wow. He's still pretty good. Um, also, I guess a sick tap to give Kenny Malkin, too, with the two-goal night with his parents in the house. Um, he should probably be at every home game. Maybe bring him on the road. I don't know. Just a thought. But, yeah, in terms of Sid, um, you know, talk about a guy who went through a little bit of law there. Um, you know, after Jake was injured and then traded, um, you know, Sid was not as productive. Um but he has rediscovered his game. Really, that Colorado game last weekend seemed to kind of get him going, and he's strung together three straight games with multiple points. How many points did he have in Columbus? Uh, one. The last Just night. one. What a slacker. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Sid's back to producing, and he's well on his way to having another point-per-game season. He's done it every year of his career. Um, a little bit there. He was close to – close to falling below a point per game before he won on this little streak here over the last four games. So stick tap to Sid, um, you know, once again, driving the bus for the Penguins. Yeah. Shocker to nobody. That's all we got for this week's podcast. We'll be back next week. Matt's got you guys covered uh, throughout the road trip. Follow along with all his coverage uh, throughout the Metropolitan road trip. And maybe we'll even see each other in DC uh, after the Penguins play the Capitals. I'm not banking on anything, but just throwing that out there for our viewers. If people are interested, if you don't, perish in an unfortunate street sign accident first thanks buddy we'll catch you guys next week thanks for tuning in have a good one everyone thank you for checking out this content from post gazette sports if you watch this video on youtube please like the video and subscribe to our channel for all of the sports coverage the post gazette has to offer visit post-gazette.com